it has often been said that music not only has no borders, but also that it that no distinction should be made between good and bad music, since this depends on one's subjective preferences. However, if we study the very word music, which in fact happens to be of Greek origin, we will come to realize that there are not only boundaries, but that very, very few people in the planet enjoy what is called music. This is so because most tunes, regardless of how pleasant they may subjectively sound to our sensual ears, have no relevance whatsoever to the etymology, truth, and meaning of the word music. And this because the word music is a derivative of the muses, daughters of memory, hence museums. We have museums where we go to reflect on the past and learn from it. So they are the daughters of memory as represented by the titanus mnemosyne, which means memory in Greek, who was personified as a titanus and who lay with Zeus for nine days and nights to beget not the nine muses. The word muse is related to the Greek verb manthanin, which means to learn, to learn. So music is supposed to guide and teach as well as entertain. And thus, its family relation to memory is not only justified, since without memory there, there can be no learning process, but also reinforces the fact that Greek mythology uh, is personified science of truth. And as such, if we analyze all the personified elements connected to the notion of music, we shall easily be able to distinguish the divine gift of melody uh, that elevates the human intellect towards the light from the rhythmic sounds that may at times give an outlet to our empirical moods, but at others drive us to the depths of Tartarus. For years now, the type of music promoted to form the psychosynthesis of contemporary generations and those of the future generations belongs to the second category, that of sound rhythms rather than music, dubbed as music, but not really music. And though these sounds may be pleasant and inviting to the sensual ear, just as the delicious meals of fast food restaurants uh, are tempting, uh, in reality, they poison the soul and they keep the human spirit at the levels where no development takes place. Just as a delicious junk food poisoned the body then, thus hindering the intellectual cultivation of the followers of whatever sounds, rhythms these followers prefer. This is so because their composition does not bear the formula that comprises music. That is to say, what the very muses stand for, and the educational value of their product, which is based on memory. Representative of our memory-sidal times, memory-sidal, a coinage of my own, okay, uh, which means the killing of memory, we have stooped to applauding events like Eurovision, where dubious figures are awarded, monster-like monster -like figures are cheered, a spectacle rather than quality is of essence, and uh, all of which culminate in ugliness being the victor at the end. Toxic sound rhythms, accompanied by spectacular special effects that stimulate the frontal lobe and e exposure of the flesh to stimulate the baser senses for immediate consumption, to go hand in hand with a death blow to what little is left of Western culture, European culture. If we are to reset our values to the grassroots of excellence, my friends, it behooves us to consult the civilization that bequeathed us the word music. The Greek world view of things, which clarifies what real music is through the elements that personify the word. So let's take it from the beginning. We have the nine muses. So symbolically, these muses would, uh, would dance hand in hand with the three, gra uh, three graces, harmony, 
Aphrodite and Ares, according to mythology. They all formed a circle, hand in hand, on Mount Helicon, and danced to the melodies produced by the lyre of Apollo. Millennia of processed wisdom contributed to this mythical synthesis, offering the guidelines for musical excellence. The muses represent the memory of culture and events that produce poetic inspiration. The graces represent grace, as the word itself states, poise and beauty. Whilst Ares, the god of war, and Aphrodite, the divinity of love and beauty, embody the contradictory elements which their daughter, Harmony, binds with the rest so that the golden mean can be achieved in both movement and music. And yes, Harmony in Greek means she who connects, synthesis, synthesizes. And yes, she's the daughter of two opposites, for equal bearing opposites can only produce balances, hence the word harmony. The fact that Apollo, the god of light, is the instrumentalist, according to this myth, signifies that music should be full of light and optimism, uplifting the spirit of the listener towards the heavenly dome, the heavenly source. Besides, the very name of the forested mountain that hosts this scene, or this dance scene, is Helicon, literally meaning that which leads upwards towards the light of Helios. Helicon, Helios. Helios, the sun. Uh, English speakers will recognize the derivatives of uh, such a word, uh, of this Greek word, in helicopter, because that also uplifts, doesn't it? Uh, helium. Heliocentric, etc. The uh, forested landscape that serves as the venue of such divine music and dance signifies that music should always harmonize with the beauty of nature. Keeping all this in mind, one does not need to research Pythagorean dictates or musical harmony to detect the disharmony produced by the sounds by the likes of disco, rave, metallica, uh, whatever, near a crystalline cove lined with cedar pines. For such sounds and nature sim simply reject each other. The criteria for musical harmony, therefore, are offered by nature herself, the very life-sustaining elements of nature. If a given musical composition does not harmonize with mental uh, elements, with life-sustaining elements, like the image of a blooming tree, the watery murmur of a flowing spring, a flourishing pasture or some forested slope, then it is a tune to askew, to avoid. Just as are tunes that do not complement the more refined feelings uh, of love, heroism, uh, feelings that, that stem from the solar plexus of the body, that stimulate the solar plexus of the body, and not the baser passions, and therefore do not contribute to spiritual elevation. At this point, one could rightly claim that volcanic eruptions, thunderbolts, and unleashing storms are also natural elements that should not be exempted from musical pieces. And truly enough, when used in moderation, storms can indeed enhance uh, a, musical, a musical composition, as Beethoven so effectively proves in his Fifth Symphony, as it is also true that humans have always sheltered themselves from these inclement elements. By the same token, therefore, a listener should delve in music befitting a natural environment conducive to his mental health and physical safety. Besides, overexposure to storms is bound to work to the detriment of anybody's mood. Considering all the above, music does have rules and borders, therefore. Of course, there are no boundaries, no borders regarding the range music can travel. But there are definitely borders around the location and conditions that have inspired it. For instance, no matter how often one hears uh, Melina Mercuri or the Buzuki uh, or uh, uh, singing, let's say, Never on Sunday in Texas, or the Beach Boys singing Surfing USA in Athens, uh, the former will not cease to evoke memories of the Acropolis and the Greek coastline and the latter, suntanned youth serving the California coastline. Meanwhile, the cultural ingredients 
that have gone into a musical composition not only take the listener to its place of origin, but also affect his or her temperament with all that this entails. Based on this value, on this axiom, we should ponder on what type of cultural elements we would like to imbue ourselves with and our children with. In his Republic, Plato discusses at length the kind of education to be given to the formative young ages. He states that music is to be of the heroic, inspiriting sort. From it, the child learns harmony of movement and gentleness of soul. Voluptuous or riotous music that lulls the listener to dreams of indolence or intoxicates him with sensual delight is strictly forbidden. In his own turn, Aristotle, his student, Plato's student, refers to the effect of music on a person's character and to the way it mirrors his or her morality and values. For instance, harsh tunes that lead one's mood into a subterranean vacuum are, refer are reflected in the grim faces and the, the, the lethargic walk of Metallica enthusiasts whose t-shirts are befittingly lavish with death-like semblances like skulls and demons. Such sounds act as cries of desperation, erupting from the subhuman metropolises of a prematurely aged world, functioning as outlets of forlorn creatures, thrashing about in unstructured materialistic societies framed in concrete. They are indeed agonizing yelps, cries of an eros forsaken world, even whose ballads echo like moans that follow the fatigue of drawn-out screams. And all this is so because, as I have already supported in other videos, Eros no longer reigns in the West. And in absence of such a uniting force, there can be no harmi, the Greek word, the Greek verb, excuse me, the Greek noun for connexuses, connectors, harmos, connector. Uh, hence the word harmony. There, in the absence of harmi, there is no harmony. And as such, neither is music harmonious enough to interlace the hands of the dancers. In such a world where everyone wants his or her privacy, arms fall at the sides, eyes rarely meet, and heads assume a lonely, piston-like movement to monotonous beats that answer to techno, rave, beat, or be house, punk, punk, rap, and pop. In their sum, uh, these bopping heads give off the impression of a liquid concoction bubbling over a blazing fire. What is particularly disquieting is that in its unrestrained boil, this bruise pews out and overflows as an acidic dissolvent, like acid rock, that breaks up all the cultural joints, harmi, of the planet as that which spreads carries all the degenerating elements that have gone into its making. This is particularly felt here in Greece, where millennia survive regional dance circles that once represented the socially harmonized culture of these areas, the various regions in the country, are rapidly dissolving. What started as a naive emulation of Western patterns of behavior by the uh, Greek youth of the post World War II era, acted so catalytically within subsequent generations that today only few romantics sent their offspring to traditional dance schools in order for them to learn what was once naturally picked up in social gatherings. Such thoughts buzzed in my head on returning to my hotel room in Athens some time ago after some friends had dragged me into one of the city's frenetic nightclubs. When I had tucked myself in bed, it seemed as if the uh, sounds of the nightclub had followed me, for I could not harmonize the incessant drone of the city and the sounds that I had been exposed to, uh, penetrating the window panes uh, with the process of sleep. I thought that if I also lived in such a metropolis, I would not be able to produce sounds that differed from those that I now condemn. Nor would I be able to get some decent sleep, 
unless, via the power of imagination, I imported the desired soothing elements of a melody that evoked nature. So my mind traveled to the serenity of nighttime whispers of fields and forests of my island home, Crete. There, I invoked the sound of a, of a cricket, a distant cricket, whose trill in some dreamy olive grove brought me the god of sleep, Morpheus. Whence I slept like a lamb. On the following morning, its soothing melody transubstantiated itself into music, into a poem, which I would like to close with. I call it Invocations of, uh, Invocation of the Cricket on a Sleepless Night. Lull my restless soul to sleep, trilling cricket of the grove. Numb my senses to the world, you ancient singer of the night. Let your sound dance in my ears, beckoning Morpheus to my bed. Let him a pleasant form assume, traversing my storm-ridden mind. Rid me of all daily cares, burdening insomnia-laden thoughts. Echo the rustic and the pure, nuances that slumber may allure. Thank you for listening.